Joining me now, first time on the show, Corey Diaz. He is Louisiana Rage Occasion football beat writer for the advertiser and uh, a guy that I see over there covering the games. We uh, we chat on occasion. First time on the air, though. Good morning, Corey. How's life, man? How are you? What's going on, my man? Uh, just sipping some coffee, man, getting started. How about yourself? Man, I am. Uh, I was out for a stretch this week as I was. Uh, uh, I was sick, but I'm glad to be back. Glad to be feeling good. Glad to be talking ball, and uh, just glad to be here, man. Um, so, uh, what, what's you've you've been on some different beats before? What's how would you describe you know Rage of Cajun football? Is it any different than anything else you've done? Like, what's the What's the interaction like with the fans? How has it been overall for you? Yeah, no, you know, I I would say this is my, I guess this is my fourth different college beat. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's actually Scott, it's actually pretty similar. Um, you know, and of course, I've been, you know, I've been on an SEC beat. Uh, you know, some other G five. So it's it's pretty similar, even to. Um, even to an SEC team that I've covered before, the, especially the when you consider the you know the fan interaction, whether it be in person or you know <laughs> you know Twitter, you know it's. I, I think you know I think every college football team, and I've even covered some FCS and and even on that level, I, every, there's there's a faction of their fan base that is that is really passionate about their favorite team, and I think that's what I like most about it. Um, so, and, and covering UL has been, you know, kind of par for the course with that. I think there's a, there's a really large faction of this fan base that love their raging Cajuns. Um, <laughs> and so, um, I, I think, you know, when you take that into account kind of, and I'm sure we'll get more into this, right. But, you know, there, I think there's been a little frustration with kind of what's played out on the field this year. Um, you know, I think there's, you know, when you talk about recency, um, it's, not quite what they have grown used to over the last handful of years. And so um, maybe that's kind of, you know, ticked up tension a little bit. But uh, for the most part, man, it's been really enjoyable. I've enjoyed being back in Louisiana and, um, you know, getting back and, and seeing a lot of people that I've already known for a long time. And, um, and of course, it's good, to, it's good to be on your show for the first time. Corey, I meant to ask you this. We're getting off topic but since it was your first time on the show I ask every first time guest uh, what's your favorite beastie boy song of all time favorite beastie boy song of all time you're a uh, bit younger than me so you may not have one <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean um i certainly grew up on them um uh, i'll admit uh probably not your um uh go-to uh guy to talk about the beastie boys uh i'll be honest with you man i don't really most, know most uh, guests I mean, I can, most I can guests hear are. about three different songs yeah. in my head right now but yeah. i don't know the names right, we'll get let's get back on track here um <laughs> let's, let's let's so uh wednesday night um cajuns released uh their depth chart that they you know release every week and um i don't know that anything stood out significantly <laughs> Um, somebody called me during the break and said, Hey, are you hearing anything about when Walt Ben Woldridge? I'm hearing he's maybe not fully healthy. Uh, I mean, I asked coach about Ben after the win, uh, eight days ago that night, you know, cause he looked like he was hampered a little bit and he said, you know, we'll wait and see, uh, you know, he's out there, he's battling through some stuff, but you heard anything uh, about the health of Ben Woldridge right now? Uh, late, latest at least to me, um, is that, um, you know, I mean, look, we're, we're 10 games to the year. Obviously there's going to be, you know, most of your 100 guys, right. Are going to be, you know, have bumps and bruises. Uh, that to me, that's, that's the indication that I've been given. It's just bumps and bruises. Nothing that's going to prevent him from playing in Tallahassee on Saturday. Um, you know, I, I know we all look back at the, you know, kind of that ball he had, um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, but, and it seems to, you know, he seems to have been, you know, bothered a little bit by his, I don't know if it's a left clavicle or left shoulder uh, situation, but, um, you know, I thought he looked, you know, he looked fine, you know, last Thursday against Georgia Southern. Um, 
nothing that obviously hampered him from from performing well. And uh, and I don't, I don't think it's I don't think he's not going to play um, Saturday at Florida State. Uh, I would be pleasantly surprised, and it would be news to me if he didn't. So um, that that's the latest that that I know of. Corey Diaz, our guest. Outside of the the um, quarterback story, which was a bigger story, naturally, you know, earlier in the season and halfway through the season, it has not been as much since Chandler got injured and, and Ben took over. Um, what, what in your mind has been, just judging from your inbox, feedback, all that stuff, what has been the second most, I guess, discuss story right that the second thing about this team in terms of all right so far through the season this has been what the fans have responded the most to yeah i think it's been um you know i think it's kind of been really eric gare um and and the kind of the return game um you know because we're getting to that point in the year right where you know your guys like you know michael jefferson andre jones eric gare Zion Hill Green, you know, these guys that, you know, either, you know, their names have already been floated out there, you know, in terms of getting a shot at the NFL and potentially getting drafted, you know, and, and other guys who could, you know, if they play well, you know, throughout the rest of the year could, you know, afford themselves an opportunity. Um, you know, I think for him, you know, a guy that's obviously um, undersized at his position, and when you talk about prototypical, you know, NFL size and, um, you know, ways that, you know, potentially he could either earn a late round draft pick or, or, or get into a camp somewhere and ultimately earn himself a, a roster spot. You know, an easy way for him to do that would be be as good as he's been. You know, returning kickoffs and, and punts. Um, I think a lot of people have been really they've been really excited to see him. You know, because right now he's tied for the school record, I believe, with punt returns um, for a touchdown. I think he's got three for his career. Um, yeah, and honestly, anytime he's out there, right, he, it could be the record breaker, you know. So uh, I think people have been really excited to see him. Um, and, and when you think that the, the couple that he has this year, when he did them, it was in moments during those games where the team needed a spark. It, they needed something to happen. Um, and he's been able to do that for the team. Uh, so fans, I think, have been, at least toward me, have been um, – you know, really expressing their excitement and, and their joy of, of having him on the Cajuns team because he's, I mean, he can turn a game in a, in a you know, in a five second, you know, punt return or a five second, you know, kick return. So uh, that's one of those things. Um, and, and then, I mean, it, it, if you want to talk about like a moment, I mean, um, and I think everyone would agree with this. I mean, going on the road and losing to Monroe, I mean, that my <laughs> my inbox that night and the next day was not a pretty place. Um, you, you just, you know, I think if you're UL, right, you just, that's one thing you can't do. You know, you can't lose to ULM, whether it's at home, on the road. You know, you could play the, you know, you could play the game, you know, at Acadiana High School, it's not going to matter. They, you just don't lose to ULM, you know. So it, a, a particular moment outside, obviously, rotating the quarterbacks, um, I would say, you know, there was a lot of oh, yeah. uh, unhappy folks with losing to ULM. Um, so those have kind of been the things, man, that I've, I've kind of noticed and, and heard about the most um, through, you know, 10 games, 11 weeks. Um, and I'm sure we got two more here, so – there's probably going to be some other stuff we hear about too. Two more, maybe three. We'll see. You mentioned Eric Gear. I've always had a lot of respect for the kid, um, the young man. I, <clears throat> you know, despite what, what folks in Mobile yell at me, claiming that South Alabama offered him. I mean, he says they didn't. Uh, Coach Napier <laughs> told me they didn't. Uh, and the only legitimate D1 full scholarship he got offered was was here and uh, at UL, and he. You know, he gets into camp and starts surprising everybody, and suddenly he's in the starting lineup. I mean, he has played so much over the last several years. Um, uh, He's been good at corner. He's been great in the return game. And he strikes me as a guy like – I remember talking to him before the season. I was like, Eric, if you were – you know, he's listed at 5'9", 178. A lot of folks say, oh, you're you're not tall enough or whatever. I said, if you were – you know, if you you were like several inches taller – do you feel like you would be as good, right? Because that chip, that perpetual chip on your shoulder and people always saying, ah, you can't do this or that. It seems like it's one of those things that really fueled you. And he's like, you know what? I 
Probably not. Like it's, it, but it, it's hard to answer that question, right? Because it's always been a part of him, so you never know for sure. But he strikes me yeah. as a guy that, like, when he, when he finishes his career, he's not going to. I don't think he's going to get drafted, and then he's going to get into a camp, and then he's going to make an NFL team. Like that's Eric Gare, just constantly overlook, constantly making big plays. And you talk about the return game. I mean, Cajuns are twenty four point dogs tomorrow, but. I look at, you mentioned the moments he's done it. I mean, when they go and win at Iowa State and he has a play and Chris Smith has a play and they get return touchdowns and they do it in another phase of the game outside of offense, that's a, that's the recipe. If you want to upset a good P5 team on the road, and I I think that Iowa State team that year was, was better than this Florida State team. I also think the Cajun team that year was better than this year's Cajun team. But point is you got to get it done in another area. Obviously, the old obvious, oh, you don't turn the ball over, you don't beat yourself, but you got to score, have big plays in a different phase of the game. And when Garrett's been able to do that in special teams, it's just been a giant spark for his team. And on top of that, I mean, he's a he's a really good all-Sunbelt Conference cornerback. So he's uh, he's just one of those guys that's you know, he's easy to root for. Uh, he's constantly overlooked, and and he and he probably will continue to be constantly overlooked. But don't be surprised if he's on a an NFL roster at some point a year from now. Yeah, hundred percent agree with you, Scott. I mean, I, I look, I, I've been around, you know, in my in my sports writing career, I've been around, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, cornerback specifically. Um, uh, there, I've covered a cornerback that's, you know, not going <laughs> to name shame him here, but he's. Look, I was actually taller than him, and I'm not a tall guy. I'm five nine, you know. I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm you know, super I don't, I don't tall, do, Corey. You, you've you so seen me. I I tower over everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, I, look. I I've covered a I've covered a college corner who is shorter than me. who is right now starting at cornerback in the NFL. Now, there's probably some people right now that are they're googling all 32 you know rosters. No, they'll probably figure it out, but. Um, he's kind of got the same mindset that I remember from the other, you know, it's a, it cannot be denied attitude approach mentality. And I think for someone at that particular position where, you know, you know, you're basically on an Island when you're in the NFL playing at corner for, you know, 70% of the time, it's just you and you're matched up with the guy you're covering, you know, and, you know, it might be 25 snaps like that a game. You got to win most of those, you know. And uh, so it's a it's a different mentality than you know what it takes to say maybe play center or you know middle linebacker or even safety for that matter. You're when you're when you play corner in the NFL, you're <laughs> you're just a different breed, man. But for him, for him, I I really truthfully think his way into the league is is his ability to return. I think he's special. Um, there hasn't been too many that I've been around personally covering college football for the last six, seven years that, that does it the way he does it. I mean, I, the way he sees the field is, I mean, it's unreal. You know, it's almost like he's, he's three steps ahead, you know, when he's returning, whether it's a punt or a kickoff, he's just, I think he sees lanes before they're actually there. Um, and I don't even know if that's something that you can teach Scott. I just think he has an innate ability, um, and, uh, but going to the Florida state game this weekend, I mean, look, you gotta, you have to shrink the talent gap somehow. Right. Cause I think at most positions on Saturday, Florida state's going to have a more talented guy playing that talent gap. Well, if you can return the opening kickoff, you know, back for a touchdown, or if you can return a punt or if you can block a punt, you know, it's, or, you know, maybe Des you know, takes a gamble at some point on like early in the game on Saturday, maybe he onside kicks, you know, and they, and they feel that, you know, you got, you have to like find ways to do that. Uh, and if you can do that and you get that momentum, you get Florida state on their heels. Next thing you know, maybe you hit a big play in the past game. And then the whole complexion of the game changes. And that, that to me has got to be one of the biggest priorities uh, for the Cajuns when they go to Tallahassee on Saturday Hey, look, it's 11 a.m. too. You know, weird things can happen in these early games. You never know. Um, but if you can, like, actually make things happen for yourself uh, more than maybe relying on the other team to make a mistake, I think that's 
that's got to be the way you got to at least approach it first. Corey Diaz, our guest from the advertiser on the beat covering Louisiana Rage and Cajun football. Corey, what would a bowl game mean to this team? I think it would mean everything. Um, <laughs> and again, you know, we've kind of talked about it a little bit, right? This season has not been what anybody, whether it's coaches, players, fans, administrators, anybody, you know, affiliated with this football program, the season hasn't gone the way that anybody has wanted it to. It's been uh, topsy turvy. It's been a roller coaster. Um, there's been I would, I, what I would classify as bad coaching decisions. There's been uh, really good moments. There's been really good plays. I think there's been bad losses. There's also been great wins. Uh, getting to a bowl game to, to put a punctuation on a weird and wacky season. I mean, I think it, I think it, it, it takes what could potentially be a, a, a sour view of the 2022 football season for Louisiana Raging Cajuns, and I think it could turn it into um, something that could end very positively. Um, and, you know, for, for these guys that have been, you know, with the program for four, five, you know, it's probably a couple of six years got six year guys running around out there. Uh, you know, for those guys, you know, those are the ones that you, you know, that you kind of hope are able to go out the way that they want to. Right. Um, Cause you know, they, they put in the time, they put in the effort, you know, they obviously they've gone through a coaching change now. And, um, and um, you know, you, you, you hope those are the ones that can, you know, in, in their career, their college careers, the way they want to, um, instead of, you know, having to, you know, maybe go out and, and not get that, that last chance. So, but a bowl game would be huge, man. I think it would, I think it would be a great signal that, you know, listen, yeah, it was a rocky season, but look where we're headed, you know? And I think if this team falls short of getting to a bowl game, I just think Scott, there'll be more questions, um, about, the state of where the football program is currently, you know, if they don't get there. So I don't, I'm not saying it's like the most, the absolute most important thing, but I do think it's, it's pretty, it's pretty pivotal thing when you, when you talk about, um, you know, faith, you know, with the fan base and, and, and trust and belief in where they hope this thing is. And, and, you know, maybe there's not as much of a drop off from, from Billy Napier to Des and his coaching staff and, and what the, you know, the, projection and trajectory of the program is going forward. It, you know, I was talking to Coach Desermo um, a few weeks ago after uh, uh, the tough loss against Troy about pivoting goals. And, you know, before his season starts, every coach, every player, you ask him goals, win the Sun Belt, win the conference, right? Do that. And with that loss, it kind of was lost in pivoting goals and then, you know, the bowl game, while it's a goal on the list, maybe it's not at the top of the list, and then suddenly now it is, right? And I think when you have to uh, pivot and that becomes the main focus, like you said, like before the season, if you say, you know, make a bowl game, if, oh, sure, yeah, you say it right now, and, man, it, it just feels a lot more significant for all the reasons you mentioned. And, uh, you know, yes, they, they can lose tomorrow and then win at Texas State, who's at the bottom of the Sun Belt West, and, and still, you know, get bowl eligible. But um, I'm sure they'd rather do it uh, sooner rather than later. But in terms of um, not just what it would mean for the guys that have been there for a while, as you said, but I do think, you know, that carryover, the extra practices, the time together, uh, if you can win with, you know, a bowl win, if you can finish – with a winning record, it does it, it does feel a lot different heading into the off season and then into the spring. And I, I think you know I always just roll my eyes at, at people, and they're usually you know fans of just big P five programs that always win. But they'll oh, there's too many bowl games, and I'm like, do you like college football? They're like, yeah. I'm like, then why would you say that? Like, you know, I, you you don't want more football? Like that's that's a dumb take, but. Uh, they just say it because it's you know it's not their team, but um, you know for for the program, for the players, uh, for the coaches, I'm I'm with you, man. I think at this point in time, it does feel like uh, quote everything in a in a in a strange way because you have to you have to pivot 
those goals a little bit in terms of where they rank on the list as the season unfolds. And right now, it it is and has been for you know you know uh, two weeks or so the the top goal on that list right now, and one that is going to be attainable. Potentially, you can get it tomorrow, but you know, and you'd get a lot more because you'd have a huge you know upset win over a P five program. But even if you don't, it's still on the line a week from tomorrow. So that's on the list and you want to have a check next to it and you don't want to put a line through it because it would mean a lot for this team. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, and I think it was, I think it might've been the, the Monday after the Troy game, Scott, and in, in the, in, in Des's press conference, I asked him about, you know, I asked him why he felt it was important, you know, to, um, you know, be honest with his players, you know, about, oh, yeah, yeah. um, you know, the, and basically, as you were talking about, right, like like shifting the the, the overall team goal, you know, and, and you know, it, and why put so much, you know, importance and and stock into getting into a bowl game, and and you know, he said he was like, man, it, it's it's crucially important to be honest with your players, you know. He, I, mean, I mean, he mentioned, he said, look, obviously, we we had we strived to be. Sunbelt West champions and get back to the Sunbelt championship game and, and win that game. And, and, uh, but you know, when we lost Troy, I mean, it, it, it officially took us out of that. So we had to, we had to find the next thing, you know, and, and, um, and getting to a bowl game is, is that thing, you know? Um, and, you know, and you, obviously you hope when you're a coach, right. When you, when you spell it out for your players like that, you hope that they don't put, you know, too much undue pressure on themselves and they can just go out there and be loose and, and play fast and, and without, you know, thinking and, and, um, you know, and credit to, to the UL's players. Right. I mean, uh, I'll be honest, Scott, I thought Georgia Southern would probably win that game uh, the other Thursday night and, um, and credit, you know, especially uh, Lamar Morgan and the defensive staff, man, they had a tremendous game plan and they executed it to near perfection. Um, and they, again, big win because it afforded you, it afforded you some, some wiggle room. Like if this team was four and six right now and, and had to go yeah. win in Tallahassee on Saturday to even still have a chance to be bowl eligible. I mean, Scott, I mean, you want to talk about backs against your wall. I mean, you might be like inside of the wall, you know, like <laughs> I just, that's, that would be a tough ask you know, especially with how inconsistent this team has been, um, you know, but at the same time, right. They've been so inconsistent. Like maybe it wouldn't surprise me. They go to knocked off Florida state, you know, at their place. And, you know, it's like, you know, who is this team? You know, like don't really know half the time, but uh, it, the win against Georgia state was huge. It, it gave them that wiggle room. Now it really kind of takes almost all the pressure off of them for Saturday going to Florida State, I mean, they can play as loose as they want to, right? And usually in these G5 versus P5 games, when the G5 team is loose, I think, you know, in the season opener a few years ago when they went up to, to Ames, Iowa and knocked off Iowa State, I think Billy and his team, I think they were loose that day. I mean, what do we have to lose, right? We're just going to play football. Like, let's just put our helmets on, strap our chin straps up, and let's just go, you know? And they ended up winning the game. So, and you I get think, Florida State, you, you know, you get Florida State after a big win at Syracuse and a week before they play their rival in Florida. So, it's a it's a odd part of the schedule, but uh, from a from a G five standpoint, I think it's a it's a good time to go play. You know, it might feel weird late in the season, but it's 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 I think it's a good time to go play. Yeah, no, I, I do too. I mean, you know, I think you're, you know, because again, I think right now, you know, we talk about the game specifically on Saturday, I mean, I think Louisiana has a little more to play for than, than Florida State does on Saturday. And and I think sometimes when you're dealing with 18- to 22-year-old kids, I mean, that, that that stuff matters too, right? It's like that kind of that self-motivating factor. And I think, you know, I, I'm not saying that Florida State's not going to be motivated on Saturday. Of course, I'm not around that football program, and, and I don't know kind of what the vibe is this week heading into this game. But, um, you know, I, I think for the Cajuns, man, it's just like, look, man, what do we have to lose? I mean, we again, we afforded ourselves this game. We don't have to win it to, to stay in the bowl hunt. Um, just go play. Go play loose and go play fast and, and you know, make snap decisions and, and trust what you see and, and, you know, let the chips fall where they may. I mean, 
you go out there and you get a you get an early punt return for a touchdown with Eric or, or you know something big happen on special teams. You just truthfully never know uh, what can happen in these things. So, um, you know, I, I think I think the last I saw, I think the spread's twenty four. Um, yeah. I mean, that could be like where this game is. you know could be a you know could be a thirty four ten type game. But you know, if you if you hit on a, a one of two of those swing plays, man, it could. I mean, it could it could change things. Corey Diaz has been our guest. You can follow him on Twitter at by Corey Diaz, B Y Corey Diaz, unless Twitter dies soon. But I don't think that's going to happen. Um, <laughs> despite uh, you know everyone on that app last night, uh, go give him a follow. Check out his stuff for uh, for the advertiser and uh, at theadvertiser dot com. Corey, man, I appreciate you taking the time, dude. Uh, let's do it again in the future. All right, have a great weekend. Yeah, man, appreciate you. Let's do it again for sure. You got it. That is Corey Diaz. Good to get him on the show. I hadn't had him on yet, but uh, got to get his thoughts on that one tomorrow.